We are now two months into the six month deadline before DACA expires. That's the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Almost 800,000 people brought to the country illegally as children are covered. They're called dreamers. They're allowed to live and work in the country legally, the country they've known for most of their lives. After they meet certain criteria, they pay a certain fee, they have a certain education level, and they have a clean criminal record. Right now, there's been no firm movement toward passing a bill to make this permanent, despite widespread support in the American public and from both sides of the aisle. We're seeing taxes put in front of this at the, at right now. We have been committed to telling Dreamers personal stories here on The Y to know who this affects. We've spoken with a young woman from Canada, two young men from Mexico. Tonight, Catalina Velasquez, brought to the U.S. in 2002 from Colombia. She's worked on a presidential campaign during her time here. She's co-founded three national organizations and is an advocate for trans immigrants like herself. Tonight, Catalina's story, her personal DACA experience. It takes a lot of skills to unplug a chicken. It takes a lot of skills to work the field. Hmm. And I don't think that a Georgetown degree that I hold makes me any more deserving or human than people in other spaces. And as a transgender woman, I need to recognize that very few people of my background are in this space mm -hmm. or will benefit from something like Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. We forget that we don't live in silos. And while my immigrant identity is important, transgender people face huge discrimination in this country, and we're practically barred from employment. When I'm hearing you talk, uh, I do hear more resistance uh, in your personal message, and it always comes from a personal experience. Um, still, you would like to become an American citizen, or does that not matter to you? I mean, it's extremely important to me to be able to be a full member um, of society and participate in all elements of public life, I think that that's, that's not where my apprehension comes from. My apprehension comes from the fact that the deserving versus not deserving immigrant narratives um, lead to vitriolic understandings and like the demonization of people who won't benefit from a Clean Dream Act. Now, right now we're talking about a Clean Dream Act. We need that and it will benefit my deported family they were all sent to Colombia my first semester at Georgetown. Mm -hmm. but, but at the same time, they're facing risk there because the government was unable to see their credible fear um, of going back and, and not just see, but actually work with humanitarian refugees like my parents and sister. I have to say, it's pretty incredible the things that you've accomplished. Uh, you own your own business. You have worked on presidential campaigns, you're an ambassador. How did you wind up here doing this? I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, there's an element of luck and an element of the wonderful people that have touched my life and invested in me and believed in me um, despite being an immigrant or um, despite being a trans woman. And I think that those things uh, have led to, to my career success. Uh, but I have to I have to credit DACA for what he has done. He has facilitated my ability to share my brilliance with the world, mm -hmm. with people in the United States. Families are so fundamental and we hold them up and we value them and you feel like maybe immigrant families aren't treated the same. That and the fact that like there is this um, underappreciation for the socio cultural contributions that immigrants bring to this country. I mean, we're really right now standing at a park full of trucks from food from all over the world. Yeah. And those are small business owners in their majority immigrants or um, former immigrants or of immigrant descent um, celebrating their multiculturalism, right? Mm. The different identities yeah. that they have and making it uh, easy for us to have multiple lunch options. When we think of immigration, and I always say this, we need to think of immigration in the context of foreign policy. Immigration is a symptom of the humanizing foreign U.S. policy that kills, that is militaristic, unilateral. And what that means is that U.S. presence abroad has fueled migrant waves of migrants into this country. I think that the, the, those intersections and that deep understanding of U.S. history and the way you, the U.S. shows up in the world needs to be an added element to conversations 
around immigration because instead of demonizing immigrants, we should take responsibility for what has been done uh, in other places. With the current conversation, what you're talking about is broad and goes back a long time in order to get something like DACA codified and made permanent for now that might actually work against it because it would raise the hackles of people who might otherwise see a group who is young, who is motivated, who they feel has merited this. Um, and those things sometimes are at odds. Um, and so that's the tough thing about the immigration debate. To do the morally righteous thing, is it's complicated, but, but we must keep in, in mind that you're not doing us a favor. We have paid with our families, we have paid with our labor, we have been uninsured and underappreciated and continue to want to be here and still want to be made to feel that we have to somehow be thankful to people considering us for an application that we have submitted over, in my case, 15 years ago. I mean, I have built my life here. Um, and deporting a transgender woman like myself to a place like Colombia could mean a death sentence.